Welcome to today's webinar, Data Tools for Change, the Community Opportunity Index. I'm Sarah Truhaft, Deputy Director at PolicyLink, and I'll be your moderator today. For those of you who are new to PolicyLink, we are a National Research and Action Institute advancing economic and social equity. This webinar is sponsored by the National Equity Atlas, a new online data resource developed by PolicyLink and the Program for Environmental and Regional Equity at the University of Southern California. We built the Atlas to be a tool for the growing movement for an equitable, resilient, prosperous economy. For the past several years, PolicyLink and Peer, along with many local partners, have been making the case that equity just and fair inclusion of all people, regardless of their race, ancestry, gender, or zip code, is not only the right thing to do, but also necessary to build strong regions and a prosperous economy. In other words, racial equity is actually a smart economic strategy as well. This is especially true as we quickly become a nation in which the majority of people are people of color. Yet, inequality is skyrocketing and racial inequities remain wide and persistent. Already, more than half of all children in our public schools are of color, and communities of color are driving growth in nearly every community, from the suburbs to rural areas to big cities that have always been diverse. These inevitable demographic changes make strategies to include everyone in our economy and our democracy even more urgent. We say equity is the superior growth model. The Atlas is a tool to provide you with the data and policy ideas to measure and track the state of equity in your community and make the case for equitable growth. It provides extensive data, some of it never before publicly available, on 25 now <laughs> indicators of demographic change and equity and the economic benefits of equity. We provide these indicators for the largest 150 metropolitan regions, all 50 states, and the U.S. as a whole. What's particularly unique about the Atlas is that it provides data that is disaggregated by race and ethnicity at the metro level for consistently defined regions going back to 1980 and with projections on demographics through 2040. It's also a living resource that we will expand over time, and we just released four new indicators this week. One of the things we know is critical for those working to advance equity in regions is detailed data at the neighborhood level, and that's why our team is so excited to introduce you to the new Child Opportunity Index tool from Diversity Data Kids. Decades of research has proven that the neighborhood where you are born plays a significant role in determining your health, well-being, and lifelong economic success. When children grow up in high-opportunity communities with good schools, access to transportation, jobs, grocery stores, and safe, healthy environments, they thrive. And when they grow up in communities that lack these ingredients of success, they often don't reach their full potential. The research also shows that neighborhoods are highly unequal that children of color are much more likely to grow up in low opportunity neighborhoods and that the problem lasts for generations. For example, when sociologist Patrick Sharkey examined what's happened to the families living in high poverty neighborhoods back in 1972, he found that seven out of ten of them were still living in high poverty neighborhoods. Given what we know about how much neighborhoods matter for children's health, neighborhood level data is critical for developing strategies to advance health equity and build an equitable economy. The Child Opportunity Index is a great new tool um, that you can use to advance health equity in your regions and states. So let me tell you about our agenda today. First, you'll hear from Colby Daly, who's Managing Director of the Build Healthy Places Network. And Colby will talk about how they are working to bring together community development and health practitioners to build healthy neighborhoods. Then, Dolores Acevedo Garcia, Professor of Human Development and Social Policy at Brandeis University and the Director of DiversityDataKids.org will introduce you to the Child Opportunity Index tool. And after that, Renee Boynton Jarrett, Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the Boston Medical Center and Founding Director of the Vital Village Community Engagement Network will describe how her team is using the index and their work to advance health equity in Boston. 
Throughout the webinar, please chat in your questions into the chat box, and we will have a good amount of time after all the presentations to get to those questions. And you can also join the discussion on Twitter using the equity data hashtag and the Twitter addresses listed below on this slide. Colby, thank you for joining us today. Colby, if you're on mute, we can't hear you. I'm here. Thank you, Sarah, and um, thank you to PolicyLink for having us on today. We're really happy to be here. I am just going to spend a few minutes here talking a little bit about um, why collaboration across sectors uh, really matters at the neighborhood level um, for achieving health equity. So we know that the enormity and complexity of our health equity challenge really demands that public health practitioners reach out to each other across sectors, and community development, in fact, has been focusing on upstream factors for decades. As you know, the social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. And efforts for health equity mean those efforts that really work to ensure that all people have full and equal access to opportunities that enable them to lead healthy lives. What the point I want to make today is that community development is really an implementation arm to address the social determinants of health and achieve health equity. So by definition, community de development is really to increase economic opportunity and promote investments for underserved populations and in distressed communities in the U.S. So in other words, community development is really in the zip code improvement business. And by bringing together community organizations, developers, and social service providers and coordinated strategies um, to improve low-income communities. So the community development sector really grew out of Johnson's War on Poverty programs in the 1960s, um, which addressed really urban poverty at the local level through federally funded affordable housing, job training, early education like Head Start and health, uh, other and even health initiatives. Um, in the 1970s, banks were held accountable to investments, to their investments, as a result of the Community Reinvestment Act of 1977, which requires banks to make loans and invest in uh, low-income communities. And the CDFI fund was established in 1994 as a part of uh, the Department of Treasury. Um, in order to provide funding to intermediaries and organizations doing work in low-income communities called CDFIs, or Community Development Finance Institutions. So where we are now is um, a very robust sector. And as a result, community development um, is a diverse 150 billion plus industry spanning the public and private sectors with banks, real estate developers, city planning agencies, community development corporations, and social service providers, among others, um, being part of a larger scale coordinated strategy including everything from affordable housing to early childhood interventions to small business. So just to show you a few examples of those, you know, housing coordinated with services for low income and previously homeless populations like these. These are the, the investments into these kinds of projects by community development. Um, we have comprehensive youth development, including the development of charter schools and varied services for children and youth. We have comprehensive youth uh, we have um, resident-focused economic development, including small business development and broader commercial revitalization strategies. All of these are really among the projects that are moving towards a new era of community development, which prioritizes health and ways to effectively measure health as a community outcome. Uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's commission to build a healthier America came out last year with their recommendations, um, and in fact, uh, Policy Link's Angela Glover Blackwell was one of the commissioners uh, who helped to develop these recommendations. One of those, <clears throat> excuse me, was uh, explicitly to fundamentally change how we revitalize neighborhoods, fully integrating health into community development. So we know that community development practices have always influenced health, but the sector is increasingly embracing health as an explicit purpose and outcome. And clearly, both sectors, both community development and health, share mutual interest in communities where all people can live healthy and rewarding lives. <clears throat> 
So where we come in, the Build Healthy Places Network, is that we really build on the Commission's recommendation, and we work to catalyze and support collaboration across the health and community development sectors, together working to improve low-income communities and the lives of people living in them. <clears throat> what we do and um, what we're uh, continuing to build on is to lift up examples of what works uh, at the intersection of community development and health, connect practitioners to each other, and synthesize existing resources. So just to speak a little bit to the role of measurement, um, the way that we see it is it truly provides a baseline evidence for action, um, including tools for track, uh, tracking change, um, scale of impact that's not just medical, and a return on investment. And it also supports partnerships. It's really, it acts as a guide on where to invest and how, and provides data to initiate conversations across sectors. <laughs> So how do we begin to use measurement to support collaboration? Uh, a couple of resources here. There are um, two books, actually, both of which were um, done in partnership with the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, led by the, the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, the whatcountsforamerica.org and whatworksforamerica.org. Um, the Child Opportunity Index, which you're about to hear much more about, is also a really great example of a measurement tool that can be used by both community development and health to forward progress, uh, providing quality data at a census tract level, um, the, the neighborhood level, and with a focus on opportunity. So the Child Opportunity Index provides a rigor, a scale, and a lens that um, is extremely beneficial for those of us doing work in the neighborhood. So thank you. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Dolores to talk about the index. Thank you, Sarah and PolicyLink for providing an equity framework for the Child Opportunity Index. And thank you also to Kobe and the Build Healthy Places Network for providing context for the index in terms of the need for better measurement of neighborhood environments to improve the collaboration between community development and health. My name is Dolores Acevedo Garcia. I'm Project Director for DiversityDataKids.org. The Child Opportunity Index is a collaboration between our project, DiversityDataKids.org, and the Care One Institute on Race and Ethnicity at Ohio State University. Thank you very much for joining us today, and to our funders, the Robert Johnson Foundation and the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. The Child Opportunity Index is a newly developed index of child neighborhood opportunity, which we define as the neighborhood conditions and resources important for healthy child development. The index is also a population level surveillance system of children's neighborhood environments across the 100 largest metropolitan areas. The Child Opportunity Index allows us to monitor neighborhood opportunities for children and also where children of different racial and ethnic groups live in relation to opportunities for healthy development. Our goal is for our data to inform policies and also strategies on the ground that may reduce inequities in children's access to neighborhood opportunity. We took a rigorous approach to developing the index and created an interactive and user-friendly mapping tool for people to use the index. We gathered data on 19 indicators of neighborhood environment selected because research suggests that they are important for healthy child development. And we combined these 19 indicators into a single composite index. The Child Opportunity Index is unique in that, unlike other indices, it focuses specifically on conditions and resources relevant to children. It comprises child-focused indicators, including some in newly developed for the index, such as proximity to quality early childhood education centers. The Child Opportunity Index provides a measure of both risks and resources that affect children, so it is a measure that captures the combined influence of positive and negative factors on children. We feel that this is important because some neighborhoods may have challenges, for example, high poverty. But at the same time, they may have resources that are helpful to children, such as community health centers or parks. So we want to take into account both positive and negative factors. We took a comprehensive approach for developing the index. We gathered this data for all the 47,000 neighborhoods across the 100 largest metropolitan areas, which are home to more than two-thirds of U.S. children. That is about 50 million children. We also built interactive child opportunity maps for each of these areas 
We created summer indicators to measure the extent of racial and ethnic inequity in where children live in relation to opportunity. And we created interactive bar charts that provide a quick summary of equity in child neighborhood opportunity, again, for each metro area. You can find all these resources on diversitydatakids.org. The Child Opportunity Index provides starting point for looking at neighborhood conditions and where children live in relation to those conditions. Individual users can and are already adding their own data to better understand equity in child neighborhood opportunity in their own communities. We will hear more about this from Dr. Rene Boynton Jarrett this web and this webinar later. Okay, so the best way to explain this is to show your Child Opportunity Index and how it works. The Child Opportunity Index lives on our website, diversitydatakids.org. When you visit diversitydatakids.org, you can easily access these maps and other resources. We have many other indicators for children by race and ethnicity that we would like you to explore, but today we are focusing on the Child Opportunity Index. You can get Child Opportunity Maps for any of the 100 largest metro areas. Metros are listed under the state and where they belong to. Okay, let's look at the Milwaukee metropolitan area. Milwaukee has 430 neighborhoods or census tracts, which are the small areas colored in the map. For each of these neighborhoods, let's look at this one as an example. We collected data on 19 different indicators in three domains of opportunity that are very important for children and their families. First, we look at educational opportunities, for example, whether there are quality early childhood education centers in the neighborhood. We also look at health and environmental opportunity. For example, whether there are parks in the neighborhood where children can play and have physical activity. And we also look at socioeconomic opportunity, for example, the poverty rate in the neighborhood. As I said a moment ago, we have a total of 19 indicators or measures for each neighborhood, which we combine into a single score. We rank the neighborhoods in each metro area according to their opportunity scores. Once we have ranked neighborhoods, we group them into five groups according to the score. For example, the bottom 20 percent of neighborhoods according to the opportunity score are those with the lowest opportunity levels within that metro area. We call this group very low opportunity. Note that this map shows the overall child opportunity index. On the website, you may have the option of seeing separate maps for each of the three separate indices I described before, education, health and environmental, and socioeconomic opportunity. Okay, so how do we interpret a child opportunity map? The colors ramp up from light yellow, which indicates very low opportunity for children, to dark maroon, which indicates very high opportunity. Maps are helpful because they allow us to see how opportunity varies across space. On the map for Milwaukee, for example, we see a cluster of very low and low opportunity neighborhoods in the southeast part of the metro area. Maps are also helpful because we can overlay the child population and see where children of different groups live in relation to opportunity. Let's look at the white child population in Milwaukee. As shown by the relative size of the light blue dots, white children are scattered across the Milwaukee metropolitan area, but very few of them live in lower opportunity neighborhoods. In contrast, black children shown by the relative size of the dark blue dots are concentrated in the lowest opportunity neighborhoods in this area. Hispanic children shown by the relative size of the black dots are also concentrated in the lowest opportunity neighborhoods in Milwaukee, but to a somewhat lesser degree than black children. Maps are powerful, but it's also helpful to summarize the information they provide into equity measures of how children of different racial and ethnic groups are spread across levels of neighborhood opportunity. Having these equity measures allows us to summarize what is going on within each metropolitan area, and it also allows us to compare the degree of equity in the spread of children across levels of neighborhood opportunity between metro areas. In a recent paper in the journal Health Affairs, we look at the proportion of children that live in each of the five levels of child neighborhood opportunity. We already saw the example of Milwaukee, which shows very stark inequities. 
Milwaukee is not alone. We also found significant racial and ethnic inequities in the distribution of children across levels of neighborhood opportunity in the 100 largest metropolitan areas combined. This chart summarizes information for the 100 largest metro areas combined. Let's look first at white and Asian and Pacific Islander children shown on this bar chart. First, small proportions of white and Asian children, 9 and 12 percent respectively, live in very low opportunity neighborhoods within their metro areas. In contrast, about 30 percent of white and Asian children live in the highest opportunity neighborhoods in their metro areas. Okay, let's look now at Hispanic and black children. We have literally a mirror image of that for white and Asian children. 32% of Hispanic children and 40% of black children live in very low opportunity neighborhoods within their metro areas. In contrast, less than 10% of Hispanic and black children live in very high opportunity neighborhoods. Across the 100 largest metro areas, black children are 4.4 times more likely than white children to live in very low opportunity neighborhoods, and Hispanic children are 3.6 times more likely. While Milwaukee is an area with very stark inequities, we see inequities across all metro areas. In our paper, we rank the 100 largest metropolitan areas according to the proportion of children that live in very low opportunity neighborhoods. We did this separately for each racial and ethnic group. This table shows the six metro areas with the largest concentration of children of different racial and ethnic groups in the very low opportunity neighborhoods within the specified metro area. You can see, for example, that Albany, Milwaukee, and Boston are some of the areas with the largest concentration of black children in very low opportunity neighborhoods. You can find indicators, rankings, and bar charts for all metro areas on our website, diversitydatakids.org. We launched the Child Opportunity Index about a year ago and have already seen exciting applications of the data and maps. First, the Child Opportunity Index can inform and help guide discussions about equity in a community. For example, Good Shepherd in New York City is using the index to show that in the Brooklyn and Bronx neighborhoods where their programs are concentrated, children, youth, and families are disconnected from resources and opportunities available in other neighborhoods. Through a network of strategically located youth and family development and educational programs, Good Shepherd is trying to address these inequities. Also, the Child Opportunity Index can be merged with other data about children, for example, data on child health and child welfare, to understand geographic patterns in child health and well-being in relation to neighborhood opportunity. Renee is going to tell us about the use of the index at the Boston Medical Center. There are also other groups merging the index with their own data. For example, Cincinnati Children's Hospital, the Chicago Department of Public Health, and with funding from the Annie Casey Foundation, the Juvenile Welfare Board in Pinellas County, Florida. The Child Opportunity Index can also be used to help meet data reporting requirements on community needs that healthcare organizations have under the Affordable Care Act, as well as similar data reporting requirements facing banks under the Community Reinvestment Act. There are other applications of the index that we don't have time to discuss now, but we'll be happy to address you in the Q&A. We hope that this brief introduction to the Child Opportunity Index has you interested in exploring it further. On the website, you can find answers to FAQs about our data and a detailed explanation of the methods for creating the index. You can also watch a short tutorial on using this Child Opportunity Index. Now I'm going to turn it over to Renee to tell us about how she's using the Child Opportunity Index in her work at the Boston Medical Center. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Acevedo Garcia, for the partnership with diversitydatakids.org and the opportunity to work with um, the Child Opportunity Index. Thank you, Colby um, and PolicyLink, as well, for this opportunity um, through the webinar. Um, I'm a primary care pediatrician at Boston Medical Center and the founding director of the Vital Village Network, which strives to build cross-sector partnerships that optimize child well-being um, and build family and community-level protective factors. 
I'd also like to thank our funders, the Darst Duke Charitable Foundation and the Aetna Foundation. Boston Medical Center is one of the largest safety net hospitals in New England. It has eight um, affiliated federally qualified community health centers and has an electronic health record, an EMR, that began in 1999. Dr. Bill Adams began the Massachusetts Health Disparities Repository along with colleagues several years ago, which is a repository that extracts the identified electronic medical record data in aggregate form. Like many of you around the country, we really were interested in establishing a platform for tracking benchmarks for child well-being. So we really wanted to create um, an opportunity to bring together into a shared space um, existing data that could be meaningfully applied to look at um, population level outcomes and change for child well-being. That included our de clinical data repository, and now through collaboration with diversitydatakids.org, the Child Opportunity Index, Boston Police Department, crime data, school data, et cetera. We wanted, and our hope and our goal is to make this ultimately publicly accessible so that caregivers have access to transparent information used to inform community level problems. Agencies can improve programs, and we can cultivate cross-sector collaborations, communities can ask new and different questions. So I'll sh for what I'll share with you all today, our plan was really to meaningfully use the electronic medical record data that was extracted into the Health Disparities Repository to develop a set of child health indicators. We then wanted to integrate Boston Metro Area Child Opportunity Index data and Boston Police Crime data to explore associations um, between the Child Opportunity Index, crime rates, and cardiovascular health outcomes for children. And we began with body mass index, obesity rate, and hypertension. We then wanted to use the shared data space, the shared presentation to identify vulnerable neighborhoods, regional patterns, and associations. Um, and outliers as well as positive deviance, so areas that were outperforming given their level of opportunity or their level of adversity. And use this information to then inform our programming for public health, clinical medicine, um, social and educational services and policy. So as we heard in Dr. Acevedo Garcia's presentation, opportunity varies across Boston neighborhoods. And unfortunately, the Boston metro area is among the most inequitable metro areas in the US in terms of opportunities for Hispanic and black children, with six in 10 Hispanic children and over half of the black children living in very low opportunity neighborhoods that are highlighted in the light areas on our Boston metro map. When we looked at violent crime rates, which we chose to look at because we know childhood adversities, including exposure to violence at the interpersonal level, familial level, and also the community level, can affect long-term outcomes for child health and well-being, including chronic disease risk and cardiovascular disease risk. We found that high violent crime rates were associated with very low opportunity areas. So our crime is in the green bubbles that you see on our chart, and the larger the bubble, the higher the crime rate. Uh, this was based on 2009 Boston Police Department um, violent incident reports that were aggregated at the census track level. So crime rates as incidents per cent square mile, then aggregated up. We then looked at the clustering of violent crime. And what I mean by that was the extent to which high areas of violent crime were next to each other. And those are the areas outlined with the green on the map that you see here. And we found that the clustering of high crime was also overlaying the clustering of very low opportunity on the Child Opportunity Index. We next began to look at our aggregate 
data on obesity for all children ages 3 to 18 years old. This was over 50,000 children that we had that we were exploring this outcome in from our electronic medical record data. And we found that rates of obesity correlated with very low opportunity on the Child Opportunity Index, although we also noted some outliers that are present on our map. So the red bubbles are rates of obesity that are larger as the rate is higher. Um, and as you can see, there is a clustering and an association with the very low opportunity neighborhoods. But there are some neighborhoods that are um, performing better, given their low opportunity, and some neighborhoods that are worse. And if you remember where violent crime clustered, there was also an association between violent crime and rates of obesity. Next, we looked at Child Opportunity Index and hypertension rate and found a similar pattern, um, again looking at hypertension for children ages 3 to 18 years old um, based on extracted electronic medical record data. We also found a similar association with high crime rate um, and hypertension rate as well as clustering of high crime and hypertension. So the Child Opportunity Index allowed exploration in two different ways for us, which really is about expounding our ability to understand patterns. One, the Child Opportunity Index allowed us to look at multiple neighborhood level factors that affect child health development and well-being at the same time. Next, it allowed us to look at adjacent geographical regional context. So it isn't just the neighborhood that the child lives in, but it's the regional area that the child resides in that is affecting risk as well. And that leads to a different set of policies. Um, uh, it allowed us also to identify areas that were outliers, areas that were performing better given their regional context or their neighborhood context, areas that were performing worse given their context. And we want to investigate those areas further to see what we can learn from them. It gives us an enhanced opportunity to have a com comprehensive set of metrics and evaluation tools that can help um, us uh, support a number of place-based efforts, compare across place-based efforts, and finally get to the uh, ability to look at population level change in a surveillance model over time. So we're really excited about this opportunity. Next, we have implications in that high crime rates are associated with very low child opportunity, but both crime and Child Opportunity Index are associated with early predictors of cardiovascular health risk, obesity, and hypertension. Should this be information then be used to help consider the population health benefits of crime reduction programs? So should crime reduction programs and policies and policies to build community assets and opportunities for children also be weighted in terms of their health benefit. And we're really excited about being able to bring this argument to our policymakers, our community-based organizations, um, as well as other health service agencies and public health associations. So I'd just like to acknowledge and thank my collaborators on this work, Libby McClure, Dr. William Adams, and uh, Professor Anthony Braga. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renee, and all of our presenters. Um, we are getting a lot of great questions in through the chat box as well as via Twitter. Um, so let's start with the questions about the data. So a lot of folks that are on the line want to know how they can access the data and merge it with their own data sets. Can they get shape files? Can they get the spreadsheets behind the maps? Dolores, could you address that question? Sure. Um, the first thing that I would uh, like people to do is go to our site and explore the map for the metropolitan area that they are interested in. And then uh, you will be able to download um, the opportunity scores from the website. Uh, we are also working with different groups that are interested in a particular area and have questions about how to use the index. I mentioned a few examples during my presentation. So if you would like um, some technical guidance or uh, you have some conceptual questions about how to apply the index to your particular community, please email us, and you will also be able to do that through the website. Thank you so much. 
Another question that came in that's really relevant to the work that PolicyLink is doing, as well as I know what Diversity Data Kids is doing, um, is about HUD's new affirmatively furthering fair housing rule, which is about to come out um, and will require jurisdictions to look at segregation and concentrations of poverty within their boundaries and their regions, um, and then determine what what steps they need to take to address this. Um, and the question is, uh, the, the accompanying the rule, there will be a geospatial tool that allows jurisdictions to analyze and map a variety of relevant types of data. And how can the Child Opportunity Index be incorporated into this process? I think that, Dolores, you could answer that. And I don't know if, Colby, you might also have some insight into this rule. Yeah, actually, that's a great question. And that's one of the applications of the index that I didn't have time to talk about during our presentation today. Um, yes, th that it would be a very appropriate use of the index. Um, a housing agency may be able to merge their own data on their community with the Child Opportunity Index and further explore patterns of uh, segregation and inequity. And actually, we submitted comments to HUD on the new assessment tool for affirmative further and fair housing, uh, basically arguing that our index can be a very helpful tool, um, especially if people are looking at families with children as a protected class. And we also argue that in addition to maps and tables, some of the equity measures that uh, we have on our side and uh, some of which I described today are helpful tools for local housing agencies to summarize patterns of inequity in their region. Uh, as I said during the presentation, maps are very compelling, but we need to be able to summarize the patterns in a way that um, the figures are more easily digestible and really summarize the extent of inequity. So uh, we have a, a memo from our project to HUD in which we share some of these comments about the potential use of the index for affirmative further and fair housing. If people are interested in that particular application of the index, I'd be very happy to share the memo if uh, you guys send us an email. Uh, you'll see my email at the end of this presentation, and you can also email the project through the website. Thank you so much, Dolores. I'm going to come back to you in a minute, because a lot of folks are asking questions about how do you compare the scores across metro areas? Um, given that the way that the index is constructed, it's relative to the metro area. But first, I want to ask a question of Renee about the Boston project and your work. There's a pretty specific question about your partners and whether you're working with the Boston Indicators Project. Um, the comment is that Boston has a long history of using indicators to inform policy. And they're wondering if you're working with those, those groups. So if I may say, I know the diversitydatakids.org group is, is assisting with um, a component of the Boston Indicators Project, and I have been invited to, to join as well. I have not yet begun working with the Boston Indicators Project, but I have used um, their wonderful website, um, some of their trainings and tools, as have some of our partners. So it absolutely is correct that Boston has um, some really wonderful, um, thoughtful um, indicator work that's happening. Thank you very much, Renee. So back to you, Dolores, about this question of cross-regional comparisons. Yeah, um, that is a very, very important question and allows me to clarify something I didn't have time to discuss during the presentation. So uh, some of the questions are noting the index is an index of relative child opportunities. So what that means is that it's ranking neighborhoods within each metropolitan area. So in terms of the absolute level of opportunity, it is not appropriate to compare between metro areas. So for example, Milwaukee that we talked about during the presentation uh, has much lower income across the metro than Boston. So absolute levels of opportunity are going to be higher in Boston. However, we can compare the concentration of children uh, of different racial groups uh, in the lowest opportunity neighborhoods across metros. And an analogy that we find helpful is that uh, we compare areas with very, very different levels of income in terms of the degree of income inequality. And it's, um, it's helpful to think about it like that. Absolute levels of opportunity are not uh, comparable across metro areas. 
that the degree of inequity in the distribution of children within metro areas is something that we can compare across metros. So Boston may be a more affluent area than Milwaukee, yet in both metro areas about 60% of black children live in very low opportunity neighborhoods. Thank you very much. Um, I think that you addressed a lot of these questions with that answer. Uh, another question about the data um, has to do with smaller populations. So a question about what data is available that includes the American Indian and Native American population, and if you want to address other small populations, how you've dealt with that. Uh, sure. Again, uh, people uh, should uh, visit the site and explore the, the metro maps that we have under the Child Opportunity Maps tab and also our indicators. So um, you can find further population groups if you use the, the tools on the site. Uh, for the purpose of the presentation, we'll focus on the main groups uh, just to make the presentation more digestible. Great, thanks. Another question is about non-metro areas and if you can explore non-metro areas outside of the 100 metros that are available. Uh, right now we have data for um, the 100 largest metro areas. We don't have data for the smaller metro areas and we don't have data for other geographies. However, some of the data requests that we are getting are for group, from groups that are interested in looking at a particular section of the metro area, for example, just the urban core and we have been helping them either uh, with technical advice or you know, just talking to them about how to recalibrate the index for um, just the core and uh, other groups are using it for another type of area, for example, a county, like I mentioned the example of the Juvenile Welfare Board in Pinellas County, Florida, so they are also recalibrating the index for that. So again, the best way to uh, let us know uh, is um, use the website and we will get back to you, tell us the type of geography that you're interested in, what is the type of analysis or policy purpose, um, and then uh, we will be able to help you um, think through the issues and uh, in some cases also provide some technical advice about how to go about recalibrating or using the index for a different type of uh, geographic area. Thank you for making yourself available, um, Dolores, so much. Um, there are some additional data questions, but let's talk a little bit more about um, how to increase access to this tool and utilization of this tool. Um, folks are really interested in, and we've even gotten chat questions about how can we disseminate this further? How many people are on this webinar? <laughs> and there are about 400 people on this call, but um, people recognizing that this data is really important to advancing equity throughout the nation. So for Colby and Renee, um, you know, what do you think are good dissemination strategies for this tool? What have you been doing and what are ideas that you can share with others on this call who are really interested in sharing it? Um, maybe I'll start with Colby. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Sarah. So, you know, this we're very excited about this tool, the Build Healthy Places Network. I mean, it's exactly the kind of thing that we want to be profiling on our website, and we're actually in the process of sort of developing a section that highlights tools like this and other measurement tools that get at um, the intersection of community development and health, and also providing some sort of um, materials to help people access information and kind of figure out which tools are the most useful for what they're trying to measure or understand. So in terms of disse dissemination of this tool, you know, we will be highlighting it um, and have already on our website and um, we'll be incorporating it into um, around specifically mapping uh, data like this and um, you know we would certainly encourage your thoughts anyone on the webinar if there are ways we can do that that would be useful for you and your audiences or your constituents or if there are ways that um, or additional tools that you feel would be um, useful in terms of sort of um, providing an analog to this or, or even um, complementing the work that Dolores has done. We'd be really interested in that um, and we can 
be, and we expect to be crafting a discussion around um, these various tools to bring people in and, and sort of um, provide that more robust discussion about how these are useful for the field. Thank you, Colby. Renee, do you have thoughts on this question about getting the tool further into sure. the field? Sure. I would, I, would I would share two or three comments. Um, the first is that, in all honesty, I think we all recognize the importance of kind of a population level surveillance of child well-being, health and developmental outcomes. and. The, the fact that there's a lot of information out there and it's often really difficult to get your hands around it. Um, what has been so wonderful about working with diversitydatakids.org is one, they're an amazing team and incredibly helpful and knowledgeable and truly understand the tool that they're using and the best ways to use it. So that's really important actually. Uh, two, because they've mapped the major metro areas throughout the country, there's a real opportunity um, for many different efforts in different places to actually begin using a similar tool um, relatively easily. So that's the first thing that I want to say as just someone who's kind of really wanted to have a shared um, data space um, and data dashboard and wanted to be able to compare to other places, but I struggled with that. I really think there's an opportunity here um, for us to seize. Um, I do think that the second piece of it is um, there are a lot of other tricky conversations around bringing other types of information into the space around permissions and sharing and anonymity um, and um, protection. So I would love to be in a learning space with others around the country who are making headway on thinking about how, what are the best and most ethical ways to proceed so that we can have transparency and accountability for our programming um, and policies, but at the same time not jeopardize any privacy. So those are, those are my thoughts, but I do think this is an amazing tool for beginning to allow people to work together that are doing um, uh, uh, shared efforts but in different places. Thank you. Um, great. If I may add just uh, something quickly, um, the uh, section of our website that contains information about who's using the index is under the tab library on the home page. And if you go there, um, you will see that we are featuring uh, highlights and user engagement stories. And uh, there are um, a lot of different uses of the index. Some of them are uh, for commentary and reflection about what the panels illustrate about the extent of inequity across the country. And those are powerful and important. And there are also really interesting um, stories that we're beginning to add from all these wonderful examples that we constantly hear about people using the index for the specific community. So we will be posting some information about some of the partners that I was talking about during the presentation, Chicago Department of Public Health, Cincinnati Children's Hospital, Pinellas County, Pinellas County in Florida, and we will be adding more over time. And I, my hope would be that um, eventually there will be a network of users of the Child Opportunity Index and similar um, neighborhood level uh, information and we could create a system for sharing what we are doing, giving technical support to each other and also eventually trying to push an equity agenda for children forward uh, using all the information that we collectively have. I think the power is in combining the index with uh, wonderful data like the health data that Boston Medical Center is adding and analyzing. Thank you. Terrific. Um, there are some questions about federal policy, and we touched a little bit about the affirmatively furthering fair housing, but what are your thoughts on how federal policymakers could be using this tool? Um, I have Whoever a, a wants couple, to start. <laughs> yeah, sure. I, I have a couple of thoughts. I, um, I do think that the use of the index in the um, the area of housing policy, specifically uh, fair housing, but also place-based initiatives is um, a logical use of the index. Our 
colleagues uh, and partners on the development of the index, the CARE 1 Institute, have actually used um, indices in the past to uh, help with housing uh, desegregation cases and other applications of housing policies, such as location of affordable housing. So that would be an important policy application. I think people in the field are already aware of that, but I think that we have to push that application further. And the uh, new assessment tool from HUD creates a really nice um, window, I think, of opportunity for trying to use data, not only the data that HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development provides, but also additional data like the Child Opportunity Index. And something I mentioned briefly during the presentation is that I think the, um, under the Affordable Care Act, there are uh, great opportunities as well because uh, the Affordable Care Act is emphasizing more uh, preventing uh, health problems as opposed to, uh, to addressing them um, down the road when they have become uh, really uh, serious medical issues. And part of prevention is community um, development and improvement of neighborhood environments. And one of the requirements under ACA is for uh, healthcare organizations to track the needs and the evolution of the uh, communities that are their catchment area. And that's part of the community benefits um, uh, um, issue, and they are required to report on these uh, community needs in order to maintain the community benefits. So I think that that provides another opportunity. Uh, we are understanding at this point, trying to understand better uh, what that niche looks like. We are more aware of what the niche in the housing area looks like, but we welcome ideas from people that are on the webinar uh, about how to further you know, dialogue with um, community uh, health people, I mean health care centers, for example, and others, uh, hospitals, as they think about um, possible applications under the Affordable Care Act. And I would ask Kobe what she thinks about applications under the Community Reinvestment Act, which may also exist. Kobe, do you have ideas about the CRA, um, Community Reinvestment Act, or other federal policy makers, how they could be using the Child Opportunity Index? Well, I think that, I mean, just having this kind of data is so powerful in general. So, I mean, I, I see it being so applicable specifically for the work that um, as we think about how community CDFI funds are used, the community development finance um, institutions themselves. And so, you know, CRA dollars will be, I think, targeted and used more um, efficiently by having better clarity around the kinds of communities they're investing in. So I mean, I, absolutely this will inform policy. I think it's a, it's a new opportunity for policymakers and also those investing in communities to have better information about where they're doing work. So um, not speaking to any particular policy per se or any specific um, agency uh, or public department, I mean, this is just Broadening the availability of information is going to have a huge impact on the way that capital flows as well and policy is uh, is made. So, speaking broadly, it's a fantastic tool for community development. Uh, I, I'd like to mention just one more area. One of the components of the index is um, early childhood education. And of course, we as a country have uh, come a long way in terms of understanding the importance of providing early childhood education. And there is a lot of talk about the importance of um, early intervention and um, a lot of great you know, ideas about how to expand access to preschool and other forms of uh, early care and education. Uh, I think that something that is not so often talked about is the availability of uh, early childhood education, especially quality early childhood education at the neighborhood level, and also how that may be equal or unequal by race and ethnicity. So I think that um, the early childhood ed field is another field in which uh, these ideas are starting to be talked about, but I think that there could be further applications down the road. Thank you very much. Another. Um, community of interest from the folks on the webinar is youth and how can youth engage with this data. Um, and it sounds like potentially, Renee, you've been working with youth and data, is that correct? Yeah, 
Um, I would love to, to talk about that a little bit, and I'd really love to hear people's ideas around the country. I think that this is an incredibly empowering tool in the hands of youth and young people who are really developing their capacities and identity as citizens um, and their level of civic engagement and participation. Uh, a map that shows areas of equity and inequity and be gets you thinking differently um, about your circumstances and the factors that are needed to change, to improve. Um, and so what we found with working with young people, not with this tool in particular, but working with young people around neighborhood environment and context is that um, really kind of creating a visual for that context and starting to create a visual narrative for that context is incredibly empowering. So I think it would be very exciting to use this with young people in a variety of fashions. Um, I agree. We've found in our work that maps can be incredibly motivating and powerful tools to engage people in the policy process at all different levels and youth love maps. I mean, everyone loves maps, but <laughs> you do. Um, back to the data for a minute, and we just have a few more minutes of questions left. Um, Dolores, there are some questions about the future of the index. You know, will you be expanding it? You said that now it's available for the largest 100 metropolitan areas. Is it possible to expand it? Is that in your vision for the future, and also will you be updating it over time so people can look at how opportunity for children changes is changing over time in their regions? Uh, sure. I, um, I don't think that for the time being we're thinking about expanding it beyond the 100 largest metropolitan areas. Uh, um, expansions or um, modifications that we have talked about are, for example, being able to show the index for the core and the urban core, I'm sorry, and the suburbs more uh, readily, uh, adding layers or elements such as um, the location of community health centers, the location of affordable housing in relation to the index. We are definitely uh, thinking actively about that and planning to do it. And um, whether we can update the index, no. We, uh, we can update some of the data elements as soon as it's appropriate, depending on the periodicity or regularity of the different data sources. Uh, a major component of the index is the early childhood uh, education center data that was a huge data collection effort done by our team and the Kerwin Institute. And that would require like um, a new infusion of funding to be able to collect those data again but um, a lot of the other elements can be collected uh, periodically. I think that another expansion that we talk about all the time and we are actually now engaging with different people around the country is um, for different groups to add their own data to the Child Opportunity Index. So we were constrained by having to do this index for the 100 largest metropolitan areas because we strongly believe in having a national population level surveillance system. On the other hand, we recognize that obviously that limits our ability to introduce a lot of different variables that are not going to be available for all the 100 largest metro areas. However, individual users are adding wonderful reach and nuanced data for their own communities. And we really look forward to doing that with particular uh, metro areas or parts of metro areas uh, to enhance the index for a particular use. Thank you so much. It's really exciting. I think I can feel the excitement coming from um, the other line through the chat. Um, thank you so much to everybody, all of our presenters, and all of you who joined us and shared your ideas and questions. Um, this slide that you see now are links to resources, and we will be sending out this webinar recording to you. Um, also, when you exit, please uh, take a minute to fill out the survey and give us some feedback um, and let us know what you liked about the webinar. Um, and also, we encourage you to take a look at the Child Opportunity Index online as well as the Equity Atlas. And one last uh, note is that 
Um, the National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership is a terrific network of organizations that are all dedicated to providing neighborhood level data. And they have a chat today at 4 p.m. Eastern under the hashtag NNIP chat, all about high opportunity neighborhoods. So if you want to continue the conversation today, you can um, take part in that Twitter chat. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.